Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Belisari from Fulbright University, Vietnam. And uh, the title of my talk today is A Tale of Two Mosques, Negotiating Post-Colonial Sovereignty in Algeria and France. And the two mosques that are the subject of today's presentation are the two you can see here in the photos. Uh, one is presently the Kachawa Mosque in Algiers, but was the Cathedral of Algiers. And the other one is the Grande Mosquée de Paris. And this presentation examines the fate of these two religious institutions after Algerian independence. One, a French church in independent Algeria, the other, an Algerian mosque in metropolitan France. And in the immediate aftermath of Algerian independence in July of 1962, both buildings became embroiled in heated debates between the French and Algerian governments about who could and should control each one. The Cathedral of Algiers, constructed by the French on the site of a former mosque in 1848, was claimed by the French state, despite having been handed over by the Catholic Church to the Algerian government to be converted back into a mosque. Um, and the Algerian state, meanwhile, claimed control of the Grande Mosquée, located uh, in the heart of Paris's Latin Quarter, on the basis that the mosque had been managed as a charitable Islamic uh, organization founded in French Algeria in 1917 and therefore should revert back to Algerian control following the end of French colonial rule. Both institutions were the subject of diplomatic and legal confrontations that in reality served as proxies for other disputes over property and populations and in reality represented post-colonial Franco-Algerian posturing over religious and cultural identities during a moment of recalibrating sovereignties. The end of the story is not surprising. The French state uh, was unable to stop the church from falling into the hands of the Algerian government, and the Algerian government was never able to wrest control of the Grand Mosquée in Paris um, from the, those Muslim notables who are allied with the French government who are running it. Um, but that's not quite the point, actually. What's important is that the conditions existed for both parties to even try. That is because decolonization, as I'll argue, suddenly brought to the surface these thorny legal questions. Now, part of what I want to do today is actually uh, bridge um, two histories of decolonization that generally get treated separately, um, which is the role of Christianity in French decolonization or the role of Islam in post-colonial France. Um, by bringing these together, we'll try to show that both France and Algeria struggled with how to build post-colonial sovereignty. And also to show that these two stories are very much connected and, and have very similar uh, sorts of trajectories. They're both flagship religious institutions that are based in capital cities and are subjected to competing claims from other sides of the Mediterranean. And that, as I mentioned, is the St. Philip's Cathedral of Algiers and the Grand Mosquée in Paris. It also involves religious leaders who were engaged with the so-called opposition while fending off claims from their own supposed homelands. And so in the case of the cathedral in Algiers, it's actually the Archbishop of Algiers, um, uh, Cardinal Leon Etienne Duval. And um, in the case of the Grand Mosquée in Paris, uh, two Muslim notables from Algeria, Si Kader Ben Rabit and Si Hamza Boubekar. And we'll take a little bit, uh, we'll take a look a little bit at their own identities as well and the roles they played in this story. But let's start first um, with actually the history of the Cathedral of Algiers. Um, as I said, it was built on top of, uh, of a former mosque and records indicate that a mosque had existed on the site where the French built their cathedral all the way back in the 14th century. Although archeological evidence ironically shows that the mosque itself was built on a Christian baptistry that dates from the uh, Roman period when Algiers was a colony known as Ecosia. Now, following the absorption of Algiers into the Ottoman Empire, this older mosque was uh, demolished and replaced with a, a newer mosque sometime in the first half of the 16th century, um, and uh, was claimed to be known as the, the Kichawa Mosque. And that you can see a cross section of this mosque um, in, the, in the image on the screen. Um, this mosque actually became the personal property of the day of Algiers and uh, was his a personal place of worship. It was located right next to the day's palace, um, right at the foot of the Kasbah, 
Um, but following, um, or around the time of the French conquest in 1830, the mosque has actually fallen into disrepair and hadn't really been used much. Um, nonetheless, um, upon the surrender of the day of Algiers, uh, a large part of his own property got transferred to French military authorities as part of the surrender. This included both his palace and the Kachawa Mosque. Uh, now, the mosque attracted the eye of discerning French colonial officials who decided that this would actually be uh, the perfect place to build Algiers' first, um, first real house of Catholic worship. And in December of 1831, uh, French troops seized the building against the protests of the local population. And a year later, on Christmas Eve 1832, it was inaugurated as the St. Philip's Cathedral. And I'll show you in this image here, you can see the main building in the front that is was formerly the Day's Palace, which would become the seat of the French colonial government in Algeria. And right next to it, you can see a dome that has a, a cross on it. And that is actually the dome of the Kichawa Mosque that had been converted into the first iteration of the St. Philip's Cathedral. Now, 12 years later in 1844, the government general of Algeria decided to demolish the Ottoman era structure um, and construct a larger, more opulent um, cathedral to reflect France's ever increasing commitment to its colonizing mission in North Africa. Uh, the new cathedral was constructed between 1848 and 1890 in an Orientalist style that blended Moorish revival and Neo Byzantine elements. As you can see here, it um, looks quite striking. And the two bell towers uh, were actually modeled off of, off of minarets um, from the Al Nasser Muhammad Mosque in the Cairo Citadel, which ironically enough, um, by the look of it, led a lot of um, Algerians or Algerian Muslims to uh, believe that this structure was the actual Ottoman mosque that the French had taken by force and converted. Um, and not that there is an older structure there. Um, until 1962, the cathedral would serve as a seat of the Archdiocese of Algiers and provide ecclesiastical services to the city's European settler population, uh, known in French as Pied Noir. Uh, and at the turn of the century, the Pied Noir population in Algiers was around 81,000, and that would grow substantially to about 300,000 in the city by the start of the Algerian Revolution in 1915. Uh, 54. And in total, European settlers comprised around 1 million total inhabitants of the colony, or roughly 10% of the population on the eve of independence in 1962. Now, however, after the end of the Algerian War, a substantial number of settlers would leave Algeria, about 700,000. And that would have severe repercussions for the Catholic Church in Algeria. Perhaps no one understood this better than the Archbishop of Algiers himself, Lyon Etienne Duval, who you can see here on the left hand of the screen in glasses. And now Duval was an interesting man. He was not a settler. Uh, he was born in 1906 uh, near the Swiss border in France um, and rose to the ranks of the Catholic Church to be appointed eventually Archbishop of Algiers only a few months before the start of the Algerian Revolution in the springtime of 1954. Um, the revolution itself would start on November 1st of that year. Um, Duval had worked hard to build harmony between the colony's religious communities, um, and he himself became very sympathetic to the cause of Algerian independence. That sentiment, however, put him at odds with more conservative elements of the clergy, and not to mention a very large number of Algeria settler population. The archbishop uh, earned the nickname Mohammed Duval, um, as well as a slew of death threats from those who had considered his actions as a betrayal of both the cause of French Algeria and a Christian North Africa. Um, Duval's position on independence, however, attracted the attention of Algerian nationalists in the National Liberation Front, or the Front de Libération Nationale, uh, hereafter I'll refer to as the FLN. And they contacted him in the spring of 1961, about a year uh, before the Evian Accords would be signed, through an intermediary named Pierre Cholet, um, who was a liberal Pied Noir doctor who had been assisting the FLN in Tunisia. And the Front wanted to discuss the future of the Catholic Church in an independent Algeria. Um, in many ways, uh, they saw the church as playing a possibly very important role, particularly if 
at the time it was envisioned many settlers might actually stay on in an independent Algeria. And of course, not to mention that the Catholic Church um, had substantial property, although as we'll see in just a moment, that property was not actually the Catholic Church as much as it was the French states. Um, the, a meeting therefore was arranged between Pierre Cholet and one of um, uh, Archbishop Duval's uh, more liberal um, priests, a man named Jean Scoteau. They met in Genoa in June of 1961 and they hashed out an agreement um, more or less representing the two sides, Pierre Cholet for the FLN, Jean Scoteau for the Catholic Church in Algeria, um, in which they, they discussed you know, what would ultimately happen to say Catholic uh, schools in an independent Algeria. They discussed the importance of freedom of worship. This was very important to Archbishop Duval, um, but most importantly, uh, the fate of Catholic churches that had formerly been mosques or had been built on the site of mosques and the Cathedral of Algiers was not the only one. Uh, in fact, Duval would launch an investigation into finding other cases. And in the end, it was decided that the Cathedral of Algiers, in addition uh, to three other churches, uh, the Church of Our Lady of Victories and the Church of the Holy Cross in Algiers and the Cathedral of Constantine would actually be handed over to the Algerian government um, after independence. Now, Duval's willingness to do this was a principle of practicality as much as it was of principle. He thought it was certainly going to be a good faith effort. Uh, he wanted to keep the church on good terms with the future Algerian government, but also uh, the exodus of settlers actually deprived the Cathedral of Algiers of most of, most of its parishioners. This was particularly true of the kind of working class neighborhood of Bab al Wad that um, was not too far distant from the Cathedral of Algiers and uh, that neighborhood pretty much emptied after independence. Um, so understanding the reality of the situation, Duval, submitted a request to the Vatican towards the middle of July of 1962 um, in order to proceed with an eventual deconsecration of the church. Um, and he wanted to do this more or less on his own terms. He was very afraid that the longstanding rift between Christian and Muslim communities in Algiers might come to a head, particularly after independence, um, the cathedral was twice invaded by large crowds um, hoping to seize the church and, and turn it into a mosque. And so Duval very much wanted to get out and, and ahead of, of such an incident and avoid violence where possible. The only problem was the French government didn't necessarily agree that Duval had the authority to do this. And its rationale um, was grounded in, in two uh, considerations. First, France's famous 1905 law on the separation of church and state, and secondly, the Evian Accords that had been signed in March of 1962 between the French government and the FLN to establish the parameters of Algeria's transition to independence. Now, the law of 1905 established secularism in France, but it also made all religious buildings the property of the French state, in this case, mainly Catholic buildings. And since Algeria, had been considered an administrative part of France, unlike almost any colony starting in 1848, this law applied to the cathedral too, and so it technically had become a part of the French state. Now, the application of this law in Algeria produced maybe one of decolonization's many ironies, uh, that when the French state would devolve its authority to the new Algerian state, um, the ownership of religious buildings that France had once claimed now passed to Algeria upon independence. Nonetheless, the French maintained that the terms of the Evian Accords stipulated that the transfer of property wasn't automatic. It wasn't just on the day of independence. Algeria could just claim all this state property as, it, as its own um, and pointed in particular to one article of the agreement, Article 19, which I've put up here, um, which more or less said that public real estate in Algeria will be transferred to the Algerian state, accepting, with the agreement of the Algerian authorities, the premises deemed necessary for normal functioning of temporary or permanent French services, and special agreements will determine the conditions in which these transfers will be carried out. So according to the French interpretation of the Evian Accords, it was the French state that had the right to determine the legal status of the cathedral, when it would be handed over and by what means. In the eyes of the French state, Duval's negotiations did not constitute a special arrangement and the Catholic Church actually had no authority to decide the fate of property that technically belonged to France. 
This had other considerations, um, however, and in October 1962, the French ambassador to Algeria, a man named Jean-Marcel Giannani, expressed his concern and frustration to Paris that Duval had done this more or less unilaterally. The French were concerned, of course, with the optics that um, handing over a French church to become converted into a, a mosque uh, might have. Um, but also the French state was involved in many other property disputes with the Algerian government over the radio and television station, for example, the railway, um, who owned certain government buildings, and they very much wanted to keep a united front. They feared that Duval's uh, negotiations with the Algerian government would actually undermine the French state's authority to kind of manage the pace of decolonization. Nonetheless, this is very much a, a, a fait accompli, one that, um, of course, was perhaps not always uh, welcomed, particularly by those who left um, Algeria. And so uh, amongst the many papers of um, Cardinal Duval in his archive is this one clipping from an unknown source that had been sent to him, presumably by someone who was uh, not very pleased with the outcome of these negotiations, uh, showing the cathedral uh, now turned into a mosque with the Algerian flag flying above it and uh, Muezzin um, insisting to, uh, to those who have come to pray that actually they should not be bowing down in the direction of Mecca, um, but rather they should maybe face France, the good Christians who have offered you this mosque. Um, so despite French attempts to forestall and even prevent the cathedral's reconversion, um, uh, the church was uh, deconsecrated in October of 1962 and Duval ordered the cathedral um, handed over to the Algerian Ministry of Religious Affairs um, on November 2nd uh, of that year. So we're going to turn our attention now briefly, this one's slightly shorter, um, but um, very similar. And this was Al the Algerian uh, state's attempt to claim the Grand Mosquée in Paris. Um, as many might be aware, the Grand Mosquée was constructed in the aftermath of the First World War to acknowledge the service and sacrifice of Muslim soldiers who had fought in the French army. But contrary to public belief or popular belief, the French government did not directly construct the mosque. The law of 1905 that I mentioned earlier actually forbade the French state from directly financing any religious building. However, it did not prevent the French state from giving uh, money to some religious organization that would. Um, and it found that religious organization in a, a charitable group that had been founded in Algiers in 1917 uh, called the Société des Abus et Lieux Saints de l'Islam, or the Society for Islamic Endowments uh, and Holy Places. And the uh, site, the group was originally uh, founded actually to secure um, lodging for North African pilgrims who would go to Mecca and Medina on the Hajj, but had kind of instead been uh, co-opted by the French state as it would um, in order to take on this project. As Naomi Davidson has noted, in choosing this Muslim association to be officially responsible for running the mosque's affairs, the French state hoped to create the illusion that the project was entirely designed by and intended for Muslim subjects with no intervention from the French state. And so it was to the society that the French government uh, gave about 500,000 francs um, and the city of Paris gave them the land of which they became the owner. Um, and this was important actually because this uh, would more or less allow the Algerian government to lay a claim to land right in the heart of Paris. So the head of the society was a man by the name of C. Kedor Ben Rabit. Um, who, um, upon the inauguration of the mosque in 1926, uh, would become its rector and the head of the scholarly Islamic Institute that was attached to it. Um, and uh, during, uh, during his tenure um, until he died in June of 1954, Sikadur did much to advance the French state's desire for a, a Islam Francais which Davidson suggested um, helped French officials in the metropole fashion a form of Islam that would be legible, acceptable, and capable of being influenced by the state. His death, however, 
uh, just a few months before the start of the Algerian Revolution was very untimely and set off this administrative crisis, um, not only to find someone who could run the day-to-day -day affairs of the mosque, um, but also to find a suitable ally to the French government. And at first, uh, C. Kadur's nephew, C. Ahmed, was tapped, um, but as the mosque became the site of increasing uh, mobilization for the support of Algerian independence, he was seen as not really doing enough to keep this very important um, building and, and site of, of worship um, from becoming politicized. And so the French government uh, is perhaps uh, concerned that this man's um, allegiances lay elsewhere was removed and instead installed a man named C. Hamza Boubekar. Um, uh, who was confirmed by the society in ways that would raise some legal questions um, a little bit later. Um, but with the increasing in inevitability of Algerian independence, um, Sihams' allegiance to France would become a liability. Um, he had been a deputy for one of Algeria's uh, Saharan departments, um, and he was seen as someone that they could rely on. Um, but it became increasingly clear that that would become problematic. Um, so uh, seeing the writing on the wall, as it were, Si Hamza uh, initiated uh, the move of the headquarters of the Society of Islamic Endowments and Holy Places from Algiers, where it had been founded, to Paris in the spring of 1962, just a few months before independence. That decision incensed the incoming nationalist government which refused to acknowledge Si Hamza as the rightful rector of the Grand Mosquee and would seek to challenge his claim legally, and they would put forward their own candidate, a man named Abdelkader Boutalib, a distant relative of the Emir Abdelkader, who resisted the French conquest in the 1830s and 1840s. Now, at stake was the question of who would control one of the most important Islamic institutions in mainland France. Uh, one that had considerable influence with the large population of Algerian migrant workers who resided in Paris. Would it be France or would it be Algeria? And the Algerian government here saw an opportunity to gain direct influence over its own citizens living in the capital of the former colonizer, but also a chance to control property in the heart of Paris. Now the basis for Algeria's claim was that the French government had unlawfully meddled in the affairs of religious organization by unilaterally naming Si Hamza as head of the society and the mosque. A decision, interestingly enough, that was upheld by the Administrative Tribunal of Paris when this case came up in February of 1963. However, that decision was ultimately overturned a year later in September of 1964 by the High Court of Paris in a decision that insisted the French courts actually had no jurisdiction to intervene in the affair, marking a victory for Si Hamza. Um, sorry, I just want to show these are um, some newspaper clippings um, from about the time uh, that see Hamza's claim was being challenged by the Algerian state. Um, so in conclusion, what do these two stories reveal? They're very complex. Um, and uh, in many ways, the, the legal challenges are, are highly technical, but nonetheless, it reveals that the French colonial project tightly bound colony to metropole. And the logistics of decolonization actually surfaced the ways in which separating these two entities was not necessarily obvious and raised questions about property ownership and provided opportunities for claim making that in turn sparked symbolic but important debates that touched the very meaning of sovereignty. Could France keep a Catholic church in Algeria from being converted to a mosque and could it control the pace of decolonization? Could Algeria extend what it saw as its rightful influence over citizens in France and get a little bit of premier real estate in the process. And what I want to do by, by bringing these two threads together is to show that actually uh, these two, two stories, um, which continue to resonate in modern France today, as well as in Algeria, are very much the same side, uh, different sides of the same coin. Um, and that perhaps it challenges our view that decolonization is less of an endpoint and more as a new point of departure to investigate the ways in which decolonization um, sparked more questions, more concerns, and further entangled France and Algeria um, after independence than it would 
even during the moment of colonization. Thank you very much.